real wealth is having full access to your time. Being able to be 40, wake up and decide if you're going to do anything that day. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we will be talking about how to get rich and build wealth with personal finance influencer Vivian Tu, also known as Your Rich BFF. Vivian Tu is the author of Rich AF, the winning money mindset that will change your life out December 26th. A former Wall Street trader turned expert, educator, public speaker, host, entrepreneur, media powerhouse, and founder and CEO of the financial equity platform Your rich BFF, Vivian is dedicated to promoting financial literacy and has earned cross-platform fame with over 6 million followers and counting, as well as honors on both the Forbes 30 Under 30 social media and inaugural top creators list. In addition to her breakout digital content, she also helms the top charting podcast, Net Worth and Chill. Hello, Vivian. Welcome to our podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm doing well. You know, it's been a really, really busy time of year. I feel like every single year I'm wondering, how did we just get to December? Like I was just I know. You know, I was kicking off the year. I had my birthday in March. Like, wh- how are we already here? But this year, especially because my book is coming out on December 26th. So I'm just I'm feeling a little tired. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. <laughs> this is like the myself? final push in your marathon, I bet. It's been a long journey. When did you start working on this book? I started working on this over a year ago. Um, I was writing the proposal and we were meeting with publishers. And honestly, it feels like the longest year, but also so fast. And I think I thought the hardest part was going to actually be writing the book. I would say the hardest part feels like it's now is marketing the book, getting people excited about it, just because... I know how good the book is and I know that it's going to help people, but it's really hard to do that without making it sound like a sales pitch and I hate people over the head being like, remember, buy my book, buy my ebook, buy my audio book. Like it's just, you know, it's a lot. And I want to make sure that my audience still feels like I'm creating the content that they have gotten to know and love. And mm-hmm. I don't want it every single day being like, buy my book. So, <laughs> no, know, I totally relate to you because I also sell like a workbook at during this time, yeah. like, new year workbook. So I'm always like, like promoting it because I genuinely believe in it, but it does, you don't want to come off as like too strong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, like I told you before this interview that I'm a fan of your content and you give out so much good quality content, like well-researched. So I feel that anyone that follows you will trust that you would put the same amount of effort, if not more, into your book. Mm -hmm. And there's a bibliography at the end, so you can check where I got all my sources because people love to be like, what are your sources? What are your sources? And I'm like, I'm not putting a bibliography on my Instagram reel. That's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she did her homework, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so why don't you start by telling us your story? I guess for listeners who don't know much about you, what is your story from your background working on Wall Street to starting you know, your TikTok and everything? Yeah, so I was, I am the daughter of two Chinese immigrants. I grew up in the suburbs of Maryland and for my family, and I'm sure so many you know, Asian immigrant children, education was always talked about as the end-all be-all. This is your way to have social and economic mobility. So I was a very good student, big nerd, and I ended up getting into the University of Chicago. And there, it is known for being like an economics-focused school. A lot of the student body ends up going to get jobs on Wall Street. Um, All the major banks and private equity firms and hedge funds actually come to campus to recruit just because they know there's such a desire and interest. And I started my first job as a trader at JP Morgan. And it was very interesting in that my very first day there, it was abundantly clear to me that there weren't many other Asian people and there weren't many other women. And by that, I mean, every single person was a white guy And my mentor was the only other person of color, only other woman. And she also happened to be um, an Asian woman. So 
she took me under her wing. I feel so grateful. She teaches me everything I know. And everything's gravy for the first year and a half. But as it happens on Wall Street, there was a shakeup and the head of my desk got let go. The new head of the desk came in, fired pretty much 50% of the team overnight, brought in his own people. And it just became a really different environment. And my new manager was unsupportive at best. He would make comments about, you know, you're too girly to be here or you know, he didn't like how my nails click clacked on the keyboard. And he, he just would make very inappropriate comments. And then one day in particular, I came to work with a long cardigan on and he touched his hands together and bowed at me and said, Ooh, is that a kimono? (laughs) And I say this to you, Eileen, because I feel like you and I probably have an unspoken understanding almost of like what it's like to be spoken to that way. And that's really unfortunate, but I knew I had to go. I couldn't stay there. That guy was never going to support me or my career or make sure that I had what I needed to succeed and excel. So I spoke to my very first mentor, my manager, and she ended up getting me an interview with one of her girlfriends who was now a team lead at BuzzFeed on the strategy sales department. And I met with this new woman and she really took a liking to me. I went through the interview process, met with everyone else on the team and ended up getting the job. And I didn't know anything about tech. I didn't know anything about media. I didn't know anything about advertising or marketing or any of the things that I was supposedly going to do. But I just said, you know, I'll figure it out. And when I got there, uh, I ended up becoming one of the top sellers within two years. And during that time, all of my new colleagues basically said, hey, you're from Wall Street. Like, can you help us rebalance our 401k? Help us pick a right healthcare plan. Help us you know, select investments? Should we be investing in the company stock options? What does any of this mean? And I started creating videos for them, not for <laughs> any like your reason. coworkers and people at BuzzFeed? Yeah. Oh. Uh, the person who encouraged me to start Your Rich BFF was actually just, you know, the girl that I joked around was like my work wife. Like she was my oh. best friend at work. And she is the reason why I had the guts to do it because she kept pressuring me. And so I, uh, I, I started January 1st of 2021, made a video. And by the end of the week, that video had gone viral and I had over a hundred thousand followers. Oh my gosh. That's quick. Was that first on TikTok then? First on TikTok. And you know, everyone thinks that's like amazing. And they're like, wow, you must've been so happy. I'm like, no, I was scared. Like, <laughs> Now suddenly, you know, you have to follow up with that. Yeah, you have Mm -hmm. to follow up to that video. What if the next one's a flop? But also, you know, millions of people have now seen your face and you're now open to that judgment. I didn't know what it was like to be a public figure or a creator or anything like that. But I I figured it out slow and steady. Wow. I mean, since you worked at BuzzFeed, did a lot of other people make videos that like helped you out and gave you tips, sort of thing? Admittedly, I worked on like the not so fun part of BuzzFeed. (laughs) I was in digital media strategy sales, ad sales. Like Mm. I was working with corporate partners. I was not the one, you know, not the creators side. No, I was like not in the tasty kitchen making videos. I was not in front of the camera or anything like that. But I think just knowing how social media have worked and what type of digital media performed well on the internet, I was able to really build my business in a smart way because I had that experience. The holidays are here, which is perfect timing for today's sponsor, One Skin. With One Skin's revolutionary approach to tackling skin aging at the source, you can wrap up 2023 with the gift of radiant and healthy skin for yourself or your loved ones. One Skin products are powered by the revolutionary OS1 peptide. This proprietary peptide is scientifically proven to target aged cells and reverse the biological age of skin by several years in their groundbreaking research. One Skin just launched their mini bundles, which include face and eye topical supplement, body lotion, and cleanser, which all come in a cute travel bag. I've been using their products daily, and I especially love the eye cream for keeping my skin hydrated during the winter. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. One Skin addresses skin health at the molecular level, targeting the root causes of aging so skin feels and appears younger. It's time to get started with your new face, eye, and body routine at a discounted rate today. New customers get 15% off with the code TLL at oneskin.com 
skin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with the code TLL. The new year is approaching. Now is the best time to invest in your skin. Age healthy with one skin. Tell me about like the past two or so years then. How, how does it even feel to have such a fast and big growth? And like, you must have had to learn really fast, right? How to like turn out content, everything. Yeah. I mean, listen, like I am still building the plane as I'm flying it. Uh, I think it started out just really simply. It was like, I have to make more content. And I asked my one friend, I was like, you know, how much content do you think I need to be putting out? Because she was the biggest influencer I knew at the time. She had 10,000 followers on Instagram. She was a foodie blogger. So not too much content overlap. But I was like, well, like you're in the space. Like, what do you think I should be doing? And she was like, I think you should put out a piece of content every day. And I was like, every day? Are you out of your mind? Like, I have a day job. (laughs) So what I would do is I would film or I would write out seven ideas on Saturday. And then on Sundays, I would film a video, take off my shirt, put on a new shirt, film second video, take off my shirt, put on a new shirt. And I would make it look like I was putting out a new video every day when in reality, I was batching all of my content. And I still Mm -hmm. do that now. It just started as that. It wasn't know, this big business, it was just TikTok. And over time I started to spread to other platforms and other mediums. And now, you know, I have my digital business, my podcast business, my book business, my speaking business. It, it's all kind of come together. Yeah. That's amazing. And you must've had to like grow your team and like have people help you, right? Did you start doing that right away? Or how long did you do everything yourself? I did everything myself for about the first year. And that's not to say I did everything well. <laughs> I just made it made do. Uh, there were certainly contracts that I signed that ended up biting me in the butt because, you know, I didn't have an attorney. I was just really reading through stuff. Uh, there were deals that I agreed to that looking back, I'm like, I can't believe I did that. That was insane. They were taking advantage of me. But... The first person I ended up hiring was my attorney because my first manager at BuzzFeed, the same woman who hired me, she and I are still really good friends, um, even though I had switched to a different sector. uh, Her husband was a producer in Hollywood. And I was just complaining about how like all of these legal documents that I had to go through were so long and I didn't know what some of the words meant. And she was like, oh, like, you know, I I think he might know someone. So I ended up hiring his friend of a friend as my attorney. And she's still with me now. Mm -hmm. We just really hit it off. It was perfect. Then it got to the point where I couldn't even field the emails fast enough. I was getting so many inbounds that I was like, this is crazy. Like, I don't have time to like do my day job and do this. And so I told my attorney and she was like, I think you might want to take on management. And so she set up a call with a manager that she thinks thought that I would really vibe with. And I met with a couple other managers as well. And they told me, they were like, you have an incredible opportunity and you're doing really well, but we can't sign you. And I said, why? And they were like, well, you still have a full-time job. We don't want to sign someone whose attention for five days of the week is elsewhere. And that was around a year and three months. And when I came to that fork in the road, I I was getting opportunities for amazing stuff, like being on TV, being on, you know, somebody's podcast, all this stuff. And I just like didn't have the bandwidth to do it. And I thought about that for a moment. And I was like, well, I don't want to look back on this moment when I'm 50 or 60 and wonder what if. So I took a leap of faith. I obviously made sure that I had set aside a really, really husky savings account, um, actually a hundred thousand dollars because in case I didn't make any money the following year, I wanted to be able to still pay my rent and like pay my portion of the rent with my boyfriend at the time, now fiance and buy groceries. Mm -hmm. And so I quit my job and I have now my attorney, my management team that signed me because I've quit. And that was great for about three months. And then the inbounds for stuff was, it was just, the phone was ringing off the hook. And some of the requests were for major deals for books, deals for a podcast, deals for TV opportunities. And my management team said, listen, 
we're more than happy to handle your emails and help you negotiate brand deals. But, you know, we've only worked on a handful of these things. Like it may benefit you to have someone who's a real expert in each of these categories. Like, have you thought about agency representation? And I said, sure, let's meet some. (laughs) And so they set up some speed dates. I met with a bunch of different agencies and I ended up signing with WME. And I do feel really lucky that I've been with them and my management team and my attorney ever since I signed them. So I haven't really flip-flopped or moved around. Like the team that, you know, started from the bottom, now we're here, we did it together. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's, I I think you had such a good thing that it was like worth it to leave your day job. Like no regrets. (laughs) Like you, you have what a lot of people wish they had, right? Okay, so now I want to ask you just to understand your content for our listeners. What has been your most popular video and and why do you think so? Oh, Eileen, I wish you didn't ask me this because I know exactly (laughs) what it is too. Okay. Yeah. I bet you do. It's what do you do if you win the lottery? Oh, oh, I see. Okay. So what is your analysis of that? Okay. Yes. Before we get into that, I want to say a lottery, similarly to what my a uh, calculus teacher in high school told me a lottery is the tax on people who can't do math. Mm. I don't recommend playing the lottery. Yeah. I think if you're just doing it for entertainment, sure, go for it. But it's really not a viable money making like solution. Um, but if you do happen to win the lottery, the first thing you should do is tell nobody because obviously, when you know hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars are involved, like you know, sketchy things can happen. And lottery winners are at a higher risk of murder, of getting murdered. So we don't want that for you. Two, obviously, you want to make sure that you take digital photos of your actual ticket, the front and the back. You can scan them as well um, and put all of that in a really safe place, whether that be a physical safe, a safety deposit box, a security deposit box at a bank. Um, And everybody thinks that the next step is to actually sign your lottery ticket. No, just wait. Because if you sign your lottery ticket now, you may not be able to claim anonymously. So you want to actually wait to see Mm -hmm. if you can do that first. you are then going to reach out to an attorney or an accountant that specializes in people who have windfalls of money. So maybe those are estate planning attorneys, um, people who work specifically in inheritance, um, or even in some states, there are lottery specific attorneys and accountants. You're going to work with them to see how long you have to claim. And then you are ideally going to claim anonymously. You know, the joke is like that guy who like claimed the lottery in like the scream mask because he didn't want his family to know. Uh, That's, that's going to be you. Mm -hmm. Um, You don't want people to come after you. And I'll I'll pause you right there because I think it's not useful for most of the people listening to know this information, but it's more, yeah, I was curious what your most popular video was and know that those tips are already great. Anonymous is the key, right? But I think that also reveals like most people are not planning, like, like they're banking on this, like, like this solution. That's a fantasy, right? Yeah. So let's talk about the real tactics that you've learned, like your secrets to building wealth. Let, let's let's go in that direction. Yeah. What are the actual ways? To <laughs> yeah, go about like the don't bank on the lottery. What are the actual things we should be doing? So I think first and foremost is always just have an emergency fund. Um, it's really important to put that emergency fund in a place where it can earn interest while it's waiting to be spent. So I highly recommend opening up a high yield savings account. This is essentially the same as like a traditional savings account at a brick and mortar bank, but you get to earn more in interest. And this lets the money that you just have waiting for, you know, the loose tire, or your roof caving in or a broken arm, just to make you more money while it waits. There, I would say we move into, this is my method. It's called strip to strip if you are want to be good with money. T is total debt. So if you have debt, people sometimes think that you should just pay whatever willy nilly and try your best. But it's a lot easier to get your debt to go away faster while paying less interest by ranking your debt from highest to lowest interest rate. And this lets you, you know, essentially just 
pay down the scariest debt, the growing like pay the debt. highest interest yeah. rate. Yep. Exactly. Pay the debt for the highest interest rate first. So you make the minimum payment across everything and then any additional debt pay down dollars go towards the debt with the highest interest rate. Mm. Then retirement. I know a lot of us are young and probably not thinking about it, but today you needs to take care of future you and with retirement, there's a lot of tax benefits and opportunities. So um, this is making sure that you are taking advantage of your company's 401k or 403b. This is opening up a Roth IRA. This is, you know, just thinking about the future, taking advantage of those tax benefits. And that moves us into I, which is invest. Sometimes people make the mistake of just putting cash into their 401k or putting cash into their Roth IRA. And they're like, I'm invested. No, 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 you're not. You actually need to take that money and buy stuff. So if you're not sure what to buy, you can easily just buy an index fund that tracks the broader market. You could buy a target date retirement fund, which gets recalibrated as you get older. Or if you are still confused, you can always sign up through a robo-advisor and you take a quiz and they tell you what to invest in based on your needs. And last but not least, P is plan. You got a plan for the future. You do not get to have the happily ever after where you ride off into the sunset unless you actually have a plan. Yeah. So it's in that order, right? S was savings, right? Right. S-T-R-I-P. Okay. Got it. So in terms of like, you know, percentages, because I know some people have like, okay, you should save this percentage. You should invest this percentage. Do you believe in any of that? And what do you recommend? I think there are guidelines that can be helpful. I think, um, you know, the 50-30-20 method argues that 50% of your money, your take-home pay should go towards needs, 30% towards wants, and 20% towards financial security, meaning savings, debt pay down, and investing. If you can do 20% towards all of that, great. If not, it's still worth doing even if you can only do a couple bucks a month. I, I don't think there's a percentage at what point you shouldn't do it. Right. And then the ultimate hope is that over time, as you make more money, your needs and wants will be a smaller, sp- smaller percentage of what you're spending your money on. And that saving debt pay down and investing can be a larger and larger portion, but it really is up to you. Okay. Another big one that I want to talk to you about is like the money mindset, right? Cause I think a huge part of it is like believing that we can make money, like believing it's possible. So what, what mindset do we need to have to be rich? Yeah, I would say we want to have a mindset of abundance over scarcity. And I think for many of us, it feels a little woo-woo, right? Because like if I sit at home and I have nothing in my bank account, I can't just will abundance into my bank account. Yeah, how do you feel rich without having it in your bank account? Exactly. Well, this is what I think is so important. It's like having that abundant mindset because when you are able to take opportunities and not being so risk averse that you're giving up those swings at bat, you're able to make more. So a great example is you get a promotion or you get an opportunity at an outside company and you're like, oh, I don't know. Like I've been working at the same place for five years. It's pretty good. I'm chugging along. I have good stability. Like, should I really take that risk? It's like from a place of scarcity, you think you're never going to have it better than you currently have it. But from a place of abundance, your thought is like, nope, at this new company, I'm able to make 20% more. I'm having an equity stake in this startup. And worst case, if it doesn't work out, I can always find another job. I can always come back to this job. It's that just feeling of like confidence in yourself. And that is really, really important to believe that you can. And I think a big part of that starts from recognizing how we visualize rich people. Society often talks about them like they are just holier than thou. They are smarter, better, faster, stronger. They're not. Rich people are lazy, so lazy. And you should want to be able to be lazy too. What I mean by when I say they're lazy is that rich people recognize that their bodies and their brains are not as good of a money-making tool as their money is. Because how many days, you know, how many days a week, how many hours a day could you feasibly work before you just straight up burnt out and passed out? Like there's a, there's a limit to that. Whereas your money can work 24 seven around the clock. Doesn't need a lunch break. Doesn't need to go to the bathroom. Doesn't need, you know, to take a vacation with their family. Your money can keep working for you all the time. 
And it's understanding how the system works that really helps people change their money mindset. Time for a quick break with our sponsor, Uncommon Goods. If you haven't finished your holiday shopping yet, don't panic. There is still time to find incredible original gifts with the help of Uncommon Goods. Uncommongoods.com has the absolute best gifts for everyone in your life. They have unique and creative gifts, often handmade by independent artists and makers. I was browsing some gifts for my family, and I like that you can filter based on who you're shopping for and what hobbies they're into. For example, my brother likes coding and games, and I found this create your own video game set that includes a console that builds and runs retro arcade games. How cool is that? It's a unique way to learn coding through creating your own games. Uncommon Goods finds products that are high quality and out of the ordinary. From art and jewelry to kitchen, home, and bar, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash TLL. That's uncommongoods.com slash TLL for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Let's get into that a little more because when you talk about how to make money work for you, people think about like real estate or I I think a lot of people think that's out of reach. So as a normal person who doesn't have anything, what are the ways to get started? Yeah, I would say that there is a huge misconception that you have to have a lot of money to start investing. That's not true. I joke that if you are a single person, being an investor is how you get to be a two income household as one person. So you go to your job, you do your job, whether it's a W2 job or a 1099 freelance job, you do labor, you do a thing and you get money. Then what you can do is take some of that money that you got from doing that thing and then put it towards investing. If you are interested in, you know, just more traditional things like stocks and bonds, that's easy enough. Um, You can do that through a brokerage. But if you want to invest in other things like real estate, but feel like it's out of reach, like there are other tools like REITs, R-E-I-T, REITs, that allow you to invest in real estate without having to buy an actual physical building in the ground that you have to then manage or have a person property manage. There are ways to invest that don't require extra time or effort from you. Investing should actually be really slow and lazy and kind of boring. But think about your income as a pie graph. As you're starting out investing, most of that pie graph, most of that circle is red because those are dollars from labor. Those are red dollars. And only a tiny sliver are dollars from your money, money earning you interest, money earning you dividends, earning you capital gains. And there's a tiny sliver of blue. But over time, as you make more money and you invest more money, that blue sliver gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can actually ratchet back how much money you're making from labor because the blue is getting so much more of that pie. And that way, over time, you can kick up your feet and have a lemonade while Mm -hmm. your money is still earning enough money for you to live your life. Yeah. That's the retirement plan, right? Is to have your money keep making money. It's not just about saving this amount of money. It's about like investing it. Yeah, I hate to say this, but you can't save your way to rich anymore. In our parents and more so even grandparents' generation, you could save your way to rich. And by that, I mean a family of four with a single income household could buy a white picket fence home, have their golden retriever, go on two vacations a year, and still have money to retire. I'm so sorry, but education costs have 10 x Mm-hmm. Housing, depending on where you live, has 3x to 10x in the past 50 years alone. And guess what? Wages have stagnated. So to make the math math, <laughs> you need to be investing because your money yeah. can't just sit there and be eaten away by inflation. Through investing, you are able to put your money to work. That way you actually have a chance at retirement. Yeah. I feel like the younger generations feel so hopeless because inflation is just so bad and it's like a problem that's not going to get any better. And it's, we just have it so much harder than previous generations. So do you have any additional tips or things that we should know to, to, to be investing well and to, I don't know, just to be doing the right things? Yeah. I would say don't get caught up in the hype and don't get caught up in the short term. So I think people will see Oh, my cousin's cousin 
uh, bought Dogecoin back in the day, and now he's a millionaire. It's like sick. For every you know amazing success story you hear like that, every trade has a winner or loser. For that person to have made that much money, an equal number of people or an equal number that. of dollars had to have been lost from other people. You have to remember that. And a lot of those really, really like hot, hot boy, hot girl investments for the moment, like a GameStop or an AMC or Tesla calls or a Bitcoin, like they're incredibly volatile. There may be a handful of winners. There's a lot more losers. And in the short term, I think people are like, okay, like how can I get my investment to quadruple quintillion times itself in four days? It's like, that's not happening. I hate to tell you that. Not with anything that's, you know, a normal amount of risk. When you start investing, the worst thing you can do is check every day. Check your okay. account every day. Mm -hmm. Because I know people who are like, I, I just invested, Vivian. You told me to invest. And now I'm down $50. Like, what do I do? And I'm like, you chill. You chill out. You go have a candy bar. Go watch TV. Check back in on this account in a month. See where it's at then. Put some more money in. Check back in again in a month. It's okay to check, but don't be checking every day because if yeah. you're watching every single tick, it's going to be horrible for your emotional health. And frankly, it doesn't matter if you lose money in the short term for a couple of weeks, even a couple of months. Over time, there are very few chances of you losing money if you are invested in a diversified portfolio that tracks the broader market. How often are you investing? Do you do it like on a monthly basis? And, and how often do you check it? <laughs> Yeah, I have an auto withdrawal or like an auto setup so that I'm just continuing to invest even as I sleep. I never, ever have to like manually log into the portal and do it. And then I actually get a statement every single month that I look through. And I don't, like, I don't even need to like log into the account. They email me the statement and I just look and I'm like, okay, yeah. this is doing well. This is not doing so well, but you know, whatever. Okay, move it along. And I think that's a healthy amount. You want to be in tune with what's going on but you don't want to be so tied to your investments that every single swing is giving you like a heart attack. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> okay. Tell us a little bit more about your new book, Rich AF. Um, what are the main takeaways that you wish everyone knew from your book? Yeah. So my new book, Rich AF comes out December 26th. It full title is Rich AF, a winning money mindset that will change your life. Um, you can actually get your own copy at richaf.me. I made the URL a manifestation because we could all use oh, cute. a little support I love that. Yeah. in our lives. And what I want people to take away from this book is that it is a full roadmap. I think the number one thing is people are like, I don't know where to start. I am bad with money. I am stupid. I don't know anything. And the beginning of my book is really me just debunking that and saying, mm. you're not stupid. You're not behind. You just haven't been taught this and you haven't been taught this the right way. And if you want to start now, you can. It's not too late. It's never too late. The best day to start investing was yesterday. Second best day is today. And this book, I hope, is a roadmap that you can read from page one to the very last page and walk away feeling more confident, more capable, and more ready to take on your financial journey. The book is split into two parts. The first half being, I work hard for the money. The second half being, my money works hard for me. And the first half really focuses on how to maximize our income. So that's yep. how to, I have an exact script and email template in the book that you can then copy to ask your boss for a raise. I then go into how to budget. Um, I explain like the state of affairs, like what the current situation. And then we move into the back half of the book, which is how do I save more effectively faster? How do I invest? There is a full 101 graphic. I walk you through it step-by-step, step, hold your hand. There's even a graphic where I explain the order of investing so that you can take most advantage of tax benefits and then the final chapter is financial domination in mm -hmm. that there are certain topics that didn't fit super neatly into any one chapter, but we have to discuss like taxes or credit scores or setting healthy boundaries with your family about money or planning for the future and how to decide what your FU number is. And, you know, all of those things like we have to discuss too, but it's just really important about empowering people to really understand that you're right. It is harder now for us, but we can still do it. 
Yeah. I, I like that. It it kind of goes in a chronological order. Like you need to have the income good first before you can start investing and saving. So let's talk about that first. I think a lot of people miss that, that the first bucket is that you need to have like a solid income and how to grow your income. Because a lot of people think that stuff is fixed. Like, oh, I'm only going to be able to make this much in my life. And then it really limits you for the rest of your life. So, So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you are exactly right. Um, My editor was like, are you nuts? When I asked to put the career section first, she was like, that doesn't make any sense. The first section should always be budgeting. And I was like, no. No. (laughs) We place such an emphasis on no Starbucks for you, no (sighs) avocado toast. It's like, okay, do you know how hard it is to cut out $5,000 $5,000 of discretionary expenses, you do not get to feel joy anymore. Like your Netflix, <laughs> yeah. subscription, your Netflix subscription is gone. You are not buying coffee. You don't get to buy cute clothes. It's done. Do you know how easy it is to ask for a $5,000 raise? That's certainly not unheard of. It happens all the time. Yeah. It is so much easier to yeah. spend the legwork to make more than it is to spend less. So I think the very first step is like knowing your worth and knowing what you can and can't ask for, both in the terms of cash, compensation, equity, you know, RSUs, ISOs, all of these things, and then giving people the word for word on how to do that and really back it up with quantifiable measures of success so that you hear yes more often than no. Yeah. Is this based on your own career? Like, did you use these ways to ask for raises? And, oh, really? So they're proven. They're actually trying These are true. literally things that I have said to my boss things that I have emailed my boss. For context, before I left BuzzFeed, my last boss, and I had three amazing managers at BuzzFeed. I have only good things to say to them. My last boss in December, when we were having our meeting, you know, right before the uh, uh, end of year reviews, I was like, you know, I think it's really important. He goes, I'm going to cut you off. I know you want money. I know you want money. (laughs) And I was like, okay. He's like, I'm getting it for you. Just chill out. Just chill out. That's hilarious. Before you even asked. Mm -hmm. Before I even asked. Because I had set up the groundwork. And I talk about this in my book, Rich AF. But like, you can't ask in December when everybody's asking. Yeah, you can't ask like right out of nowhere, right? Yes. Oh, okay. I start asking in June. And I reminded him every two months that money and a promotion were important to me. And I wanted them. And if he wanted to keep me around, if he wanted me to grind and bust my butt to, you know, show good results, he needed to pay me. Uh. And so... When December actually rolled around, this was like two weeks before the actual final end of year review. I was like, I just want to remind you for our final end of year review, I would, and he was like, just stop talking, stop talking, I gotta <laughs> please, stop talking. That's amazing. That's such a great tip. It's like you, you start in June and you, you keep like following up. Where did you get the confidence to do that? <laughs> I think a lot of people, it's a confidence thing. It's a self-worth thing, right? It is, but it's also a moment of realization that you have to have. So I think I learned a lot of this, obviously from my mentor, and I'm really fortunate to have had her, but you know, when you're looking around and, and I'll be very frank and candid here, like when I joined Buzzfeed, because I didn't have any media sales experience, like I took a pay cut to go there. I was making less than Um, a lot of other people, mm -hmm. but I was closing more deals. And overall I was still making a lot of money because my commissions and bonus checks were supplementing my salary, but my salary was like meaningfully less than most people. And so when I sat around at a table and I looked around and there were certainly other very, very talented people, but there were also a lot of people sitting around that like weren't carrying their weight and they were getting paid more than me. And I was like, that does not seem fair at all. Like Mm -hmm. if I am top of the leaderboard, if I, if my face is being shown in management meetings, if the CEO of the company is shouting me out on all hands meetings, you pay me like that. You pay me like I deserve it. Yeah. You earned it. You like, you knew you deserved it. I felt like I had earned it. So I Mm -hmm. felt really confident asking every single time. Cause I was like, you know, Mm -hmm. you and I both know to my manager, you know, you and I both know if you don't give me what I want, I'm gone. And any one of the competitors, any one of the platforms will take me. Yep. And it wasn't that I was threatening him, but I was like, just making sure he saw the amount of effort I was putting in, but also what he would be losing if I were to leave. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the preface to this for our listeners is you have to actually be delivering and working, working well in your, your job to be able to ask for a raise. <laughs> yeah. I do also mention that in the book because I think, you know, I'm not saying everyone should be entitled to one. Like if you are coming in late with a Starbucks in your hand and you're leaving early and only half of your tasks are getting done each day, odds are good. You're not getting that raise. You're not getting that promotion. You actually have to be performing. But if you're doing your job, you're not getting horrible criticism. Your boss thinks, you know, you're doing a good job. Ask. You need to be asking every year. Yeah. No, those are really, really great tips. All right. Time for another quick break. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Holidays are time of giving. Whether or not your family gives gifts during the holidays, you get to define how you give to yourself. So whether it's by starting therapy, going easier on yourself during the tough moments, or treating yourself to a day of complete rest, remember to give yourself some love this holiday season. Therapy can help you manage all the stress, anxiety, or emotions that come up during this time and give you the tools to find calm amidst the chaos. I've worked with a therapist on releasing anxiety and the need for control. If you're considering therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule, and you can switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash T-L-L. You said something towards the end. What is FU money? <laughs> Ooh, FU money is literally my favorite thing. Okay. It is the amount of money you need to be able to kick over your desk and tell your boss F you. <laughs> In reality, it's the amount of money you need to have invested so that that money can earn you enough to support your lifestyle. And this is how you calculate it. Close your eyes. Unless you're driving right now, don't close your eyes. <laughs> Think about how much money you would need to support your perfect lifestyle for a year. So this includes things like mortgage payments and rent. This includes groceries. This includes dining out. This includes taking care of any sort of kids or pets you may have. This includes vacations you want to go on, clothes you want to buy, anything. Put it all together. What would it cost for you to have your perfect life for a year? Then you divide your perfect year number by 0.5. Zero four. The resulting number is your FU number, and it's the number that you need to have invested to support that lifestyle mm. without working at all. Wait, why the is reason- it zero point zero four? Thank you for asking. Zero point zero four is the decimal and numerical representation of four percent. Four percent is a very conservative return on your money. So you know, right now, like. High yield savings accounts are earning you 4.6%. So almost entirely risk-free FDIC insured money can earn you more than the number I'm calculating with. But that number is essentially the interest that you would essentially need to earn on your full total sum to get you your yearly number. So that's why we use 4% instead of something you know higher because the S&P 500 has returned roughly 8 to 10% in its history but we're not using that number because we want to be super, super careful and safe. Okay. So it was the total number of expenses for a year divided by 0.04. Exactly. Okay. (laughs) Nice. That's exciting. The way investments work, because compound interest is so important. So once you're at that goal, does it hurt you to like start taking money from the interest? Do you know what I mean? Like you'd rather like keep it in there so that it keeps growing with compound interest. Yeah. So here's the beauty, right? With your FU number, you have this lump sum that's been invested. And with that 4%, you've earned what you essentially need to spend for a year. Here's the beauty. When you take that money out, you're still left with that full principal number. And so it can continue earning for you. Mm. And the hope is that you're not actually getting a 4% return. You're getting something closer to 8 to 10%. So your nest egg continues to get bigger as you continue to live your life. One thing people do run into as a, an issue is if they're not earning that 4% on their money, they can start to dig into that initial nest egg. And over time, they might have to go back to work if they don't have enough set aside to sustain them for the rest of their life. So yes, compound interest is very important. It's okay to take 
some of those proceeds out to support your lifestyle as long as you aren't digging into the initial nest egg too much. Right. That makes sense. Okay. And then the next question I have for you is let, let's talk about budgeting. Like, do you have like a tool that is your favorite that you use? And then how do you, I guess, what do you do with your, your finance and budgeting? Yeah. So we mentioned earlier the 50, 30, 20 method. That was the method I used jumping off of my finances in my early twenties because it was so simple And I was able to essentially just go through, you know, my rent, my credit card statement and any other expenses I had. And that was it. And I would be able to say, Hey, this is what I've spent on this. This is what I've spent on that. And I need to make sure every single month before it even hits my account, I set aside 20% to a different savings account that I can then use for, you know, debt pay down investing over time. My 20% of saving debt pay down investing has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger because I make more money. But I would say I've done a pretty good job of keeping lifestyle inflation in check. I am still someone who takes the subway. I don't Uber everywhere. I am someone who never calls an Uber black unless, you know, for some reason or other, a, a brand is chauffeuring me to an event or something like that. But like when I'm paying, I only take the black Toyota Camrys. I manage my costs. And for my budget, I have just been able to invest more and more and more. And my needs and wants have stayed relatively the same. I will say it was harder to budget in my early 20s. I wasn't making that much money. I was living paycheck to paycheck until my first bonus hit. And my budget wasn't always perfect because sometimes I would set money aside to savings. And then I'd be like, I need to claw that back. I need that money back because I needed it for expenses. Yeah. And that's okay. You need to figure out a budgeting strategy that works for you. In some cases, the best type is to have all of your money go into separate accounts, one of which pays your credit card bill, one of which pays your rent, one of which pays whatever. So it's totally separate. Some people do that better. For me, it was going into one place, but it would immediately move money into a savings account. And just over time, 50, 30, 20, it's probably still 50, 30, 20, but the 50 is the investing piece. And, you know, the needs are the 30 and the wants are the 20. Yeah. I think a key thing that you talked about was like no lifestyle inflation. Even as you're making more money, you kept your lifestyle the same. And I think that's a a key to like saving and investing more money. As a creator, I recognize I'm not an accountant or an attorney or a teacher or a scientist. I don't get 40 years. I get five, maybe Mm. 10 good years. And in that time, I need to make as much money as a normal person would make in 40. Mm, And not more. Mm -hmm. And any money that I'm making right now, I need to be so, so strategic and so, so smart about. I need to be investing. I need to take care of future me. Because imagine being me at, you know, I'm 29 now. Imagine me being 39 and being like, okay, well, this creator thing is not working anymore. I have to go back and get a regular job. And now I have a 10-year essentially gap on my resume. I'm going to have to kind of, you know, really be able to recalibrate my life. And I don't want that. I want to be able to work really hard over the next decade. And hopefully I can extend my career for much longer than that. But it's not a guarantee. So I just find it really scary when I see other creators and other people in the business who spend like the faucet never turns off because it turns off pretty quick. Yeah, you're so right. That's something that a lot of people don't think about, especially in the creator industry because it changes so fast. I mean, on one hand, I could see you continuing your business and career till late. I feel like you can have longevity, but I think it's so smart that you're not, you're planning for, I only have like this five to 10 year gap or do you know what I mean? This like amount of time. Yeah. That's a new mindset. Even for me as a creator, like, oh, I have to make enough money in this 10 years as people make in 40 years. Yeah. And you can't be, you know, popping bottles and models at the club. Like that money needs to sustain you. And I will say the, you know, when we think of wealth, we think of the lime green sports car, we think of the designer bags, but like real wealth is, having full access to your time, being able to be 
40, wake up and decide if you're going to do anything that day. Exactly. That's, really that's my dream. That's <laughs> to have the yeah. choice, always have the option. Right. I want to do nothing. Is, I want to tr- like, you know what I mean? Just to have the freedom. You can decide. And, you know, I'll be honest. I don't think I'll ever stop working, mm-hmm. but I would like to think that the type of work I do will look very different in a decade. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. a decade, I want to be lobbying legislation to teach personal finance and public yeah. schools. Yep. I want to be volunteering at, for a cause that I care about. Maybe it's a St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Maybe it's, you know, a financial literacy for underprivileged communities. Like, I don't know if I'm always going to want to do this, but to make sure that I am taken care of, my future family is taken care of, I need to make as much money as I can now and not be an idiot with it because it's not always going to be like this. Yep. I was going to ask you, like, when do you plan to retire? Like, are you trying to retire early or what are your thoughts on that future? I don't know if I'll ever retire. Because <laughs> you like working. It's not that I like working. It's like, I like having purpose and I like waking up in the morning and being like, what I do is consequential and important and it helps people and there's value to my life. I know that sounds like so existential crisis-y, but like- No, no, I get it. I do think I'll downshift at 40 and I'll downshift again at 50, but what I'm actually doing will probably change meaningfully. Just, I don't know if I'll quote unquote retire in the way that people envision retirement where you wake up every day and you play backgammon at the community. Like you'll still be doing something, but it just won't be at the level of what, at what you're doing now. Maybe you won't work as many hours, right? Right now, I am beholden to my agents, my managers, my, you know, my, my team. I'm beholden to brand partners. I'm beholden to my publisher, my podcast network. I'm beholden to those people. So I need to keep performing. Right. When I'm in my 40s and 50s, I don't want to be beholden to anybody. I still want to work. Mm-hmm. I still want to do stuff. But I'm going to do it on my schedule. I'm going to do only the things I really want to do and I really like doing and really enjoy doing. And I'm going to keep doing them until I don't enjoy them anymore. And then I'm not. That's it. Yeah. Love it. Even now, like how much time do you spend on making TikTok videos and like, give us kind of an overview of your week. Like, are you working a lot? (laughs) Uh, Oh yeah. Eileen, I'm working more now than I was on Wall Street. Yeah. I think people don't realize how hard you work because even me seeing how much content you put out, it's, it's a lot. (laughs) Like, I think you as a content creator have a much deeper appreciation for how long it takes me because like, just because the video is a minute doesn't mean it took me a minute to make for you. Right, of course. So I'll say every week I schedule time to ideate five to seven new pieces of content. I then have to schedule time to film it. Um, I edit my own content. I then have to write scripts for YouTube long form. There's two videos every month. I have to record four podcast episodes every month. I obviously had to like write the book. I had to (laughs) market the book. Um, I'm working now. I used to complain about my 14 to 16 hour day. I'm still doing that now. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Congratulations, Viv. You played yourself. Um, (laughs) No, but it's because you're in like the peak. I wouldn't say peak because it keeps growing, but you're really like everything is happening for you right now. And I feel really grateful that it is. Like you're taking advantage of it, but but maybe you <laughs> you can like calm down a little bit later, maybe if you want. I'm so happy that all of these things are happening. I think the one thing I secretly wish a little bit is that they happened in order. So like one thing and then the second thing. And right, the not all thing. at once. <laughs> not one, two, three, four, all in one ball, go down. <laughs> but sometimes life happens like that. Like exactly. it's just an explosion and you just go with it and it's fine. <laughs> Hashtag just happy to be here. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Grateful. (laughs) What else are you excited about in your future? Like the next two to three years, what else do you hope to accomplish? Yeah, I think my next foray, I really hope, is into TV. I just really think that there needs to be more finance discussion and financial conversations and money in a cool, fun way, not in a boring, crusty way on streaming services, on our TVs. And I think that, you know, mass media like that is really going to help with the literacy in our country when it comes to understanding how to budget, save, invest, and ask for more and, 
you know, be good with your money. And when you see people who you admire on TV doing a good job with their money and being responsible, like it only encourages you to do so more. So I think TV is the next big frontier and I'm really hoping that it, that it works out. Yeah, that's so exciting. I'm hoping for it to work out for you too, because we truly need more young faces and they're just the fresh energy that you bring to finance. Thank you. That's such a huge compliment. Okay. And then Vivian, do you have any final words that you want to leave with our listeners today? It could be a lesson. It could be a tip, just anything. I think one of the most powerful things you can do is just talk to your friends about money. We've been told for years that it's rude or tacky or taboo to be like, how much do you make? Or how much does this apartment cost? Or what, like, how, how did you afford that vacation? I call July and August how did my friends afford this vacation season? I'm always wondering. Mm -hmm. And having those conversations gives us so much more power to negotiate. Having those conversations helps you set a realistic understanding because guess what? Your friend, Jenny, she might've been able to afford that vacation because her parents helped pay her rent. You don't want to go and overextend yourself trying to keep up when you don't have parents who can help you pay your rent. You want to be realistic about what financial opportunities are available to you and what are possible. So having those conversations is super important. And knowing what you're worth is one of the easiest things you can do is just have conversations with other people and ask. And the more we talk, the more power we have versus corporations and the big guy. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing today. Vivian, where can we find you online? You can find me all over social media as Your Rich BFF. Love it. And then your book is coming out December 26th, Rich AF. Everybody will have the links to everything Vivian creates down below. Thank you so much for being here. I love your content. I'm so happy I got to meet you and talk to you today. And thanks for sharing everything. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. 